I do love working with Jane Garvey because I like the fact and I respect the fact that she's still quite a hard-hitting broadcaster. I do like people that will go in on questions that not necessarily unnerve the guest, but I guess because she comes from that news and breakfast background, that's her thing. And I, I, I think that's still needed in this day and age. Even if it's a light piece or a heavier piece that might be controversial, there's still a way to do it. And it's brilliant to work with someone like that who exemplifies how you can do it well, still have a great sense of humour. Hello and welcome to Freelance Pod. My name's Chandrika Chakrabarti and I'll be your host. Freelance Pod is all about how the internet has changed the world of work. On each episode, I'll speak to a guest about freelancing, side hustles, the gig economy, jobs that weren't possible before the internet, and how moving from an analogue to a digital age has revolutionised the way we work. If you'd like to get involved in the conversation, I'd love to hear from you. So please do follow Freelance Pod on Twitter and Instagram. You can also join the Facebook group, and you don't have to be a freelancer to get involved just wanted to mention some of the awful headlines we've seen over the last week about the media industry. About a thousand jobs have been lost in the media um, from HuffPost, Gannett and BuzzFeed and this is mostly in the US but at the moment we know that there are going to be cuts in the BuzzFeed UK office as well. So it's a really scary time to be in journalism, scarier than usual and we're kind of faced with these headlines it feels like every six months but I think you know somebody's been made redundant three times in the last eight years you know it's it's one of the hardest days in your career and in your life to be told that you're being let go particularly from a job you might love from your first job from a job you might have been in for a long time and I hope if you've been listening to the two freelance pod that something you might have taken from it is that the nature of work is changing and particularly journalistic work and the guest this week Leona Fenson is a producer on Women's Hour on Radio 4 but she also does other jobs she is freelance um, she is written as well she's been a features writer and uh, she talks really candidly about you know moving to the UK from Australia trying to find work trying to figure out what it is she wants to do and even though redundancy wasn't the reason I think that the the kind of working out that she will tell us about in this episode is what you know a lot of us go through when we are made redundant. And so I hope listening to her will be useful and there will be better days than the day you're laid off. Um, they might be even better than the job that you've been laid off from. I know a lot of people will say that. Um, in my experience, I found it to always be true. So good luck to everyone who's been laid off and made redundant. So here's Leona Fenson producer at Women's Hour on Radio 4. My name's Leona Fenson. Uh, I call myself a features journalist, as that's what I used to do, long-form features, 1,500 words plus. Um, And I'm also a radio producer, so a freelance radio producer in community radio as well as the BBC. Uh, And the feature stuff I've put on the back burner for a while, but I'd like to get back into it. I never thought I'd say that because I got tired of, working to these long deadlines. Radio is much more immediate and working in topical and um, news. I like the pace as well, like the magazine formats that I do. Uh, You have to make things happen right now, whereas when you're doing features, you've got all these protracted deadlines and suddenly in the 11th hour you're scrambling. So there's that kind of, the pendulum swings for me both ways with regard to that. So funnily enough, I'm looking to get back into features, yeah. I'm from Australia originally, uh, born and bred in Western Australia, so both in the north and in Perth, which is the capital, and then I lived in Brisbane and Melbourne, which is on the east coast, for 15 years altogether. Husband's British. I've got two small girls that are under two. Uh, He was aching to come back to the UK, so we packed up our world as we knew it in Australia, and we've been here for almost two years. It'll be two years in March. When you moved to the UK, did you just... Try to find freelance work at the BBC. Oh, the UK was a really, really tough move because at the same time that we were doing the visa and whatnot, I got offered a contract to work in Myanmar, which is Burma, where my mum and dad are from, and it was with MRTV and it was building up their radio um, IP along the same veins as a BBC or ABC, so training their 
journalists and um, their TV people. Um, I was shortlisted right down. I was one of the two people that were going to get it, if probably going to get it. But then um, at the same time, I'd been looking at senior media agency recruiters in the UK and they shortlisted me for a workshop at the BBC in Salford and said it's a really fantastic day in terms of getting in front of broadcast journalists. You'll have a one-on-one with a HR person. You'll get a feel for what is it actually like to work at the BBC and how will you get your pathway going, like how will you create your pathway. It's a bit like they're building a freelance pool and that's yes, your entry on that day. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and so you can imagine that was a really, really difficult position to be in because my heart was set on going to Myanmar. Um, I have a small, um, well, I had a small daughter at the time. She was about nine months, so we had so many considerations. We would have been in a remote location in Myanmar. My husband doesn't speak Burmese, so we thought we'll take the UK route because if I get into the BBC, at least then you can always retrofit, you know, and go back to Myanmar and whatnot. So, um it still wasn't easy when I got here because when I went to that BBC workshop, I actually felt more deflated, I'll be honest, because I realised the extent of how difficult it was going to be. The first thing they said to me was, so which part of the BBC do you want to work in? I didn't know my Radio 1 from my Radio 5. I didn't know Radio 6 did. So I had to do this intense kind of, you know, listen to all the stations. Um, Manny Jasami, uh, he is a fantastic sports broadcaster. He gave me some great advice right off the back and said, sit down, listen to all of them, get a feel for where you fit and then look at how you're going to make your way in. What was yeah. the name? Manny Jazami, M-A-N-I, I think it's D-J-Z-A-M-I. Excuse if I've spelt it wrong. But what, what does he do? He's a sports broadcaster. Yeah. And you met him on that day? I met him and I really enjoyed meeting him because he's got two things I love which is lots of knowledge and a great sense of humour and that works well for me when I want to try and learn something and he said he'd been freelancing for 10 years before he even got in as staff freelancing seemed to be the bigger thing in terms of what I wanted to do and again these were unknowns to me I would never have been able to learn that had I not gone to the workshop and been exposed to people so I went on a downward trajectory quite fast after that because I got kind of deflated about the task ahead. So how did you end up working for Women's Hour? Oh, yeah, Women's Hour. Let me think. So I did the work experience of Jeremy Vine in December. So that was through the... That was quite a good, really good one. That was absolutely fantastic to land. Yeah, Tim Collins is the producer there. He rang me when I was... No, um, that's the other Tim. There's two Tim's. It's confusing. There's Tim Johns and Tim Collins. So I was in... uh, Kilfinnan, which is in Ireland, for the Hearsay Festival. It's a big audio arts festival. I get a phone call and um, Tim Collins confirmed that I'd been shortlisted to do the work experience. So for me, that was just such a good um, entry point into current affairs in the format that they do it. So that's what really made me think, no, I definitely want to stay in that type of radio. Um, So from there... I applied for the freelance pool. I'd applied, I think, months before, but they were behind on the resourcing. And then I got the phone call for the interview, got through, and then they said, it's no guarantee of work, though. You're in, but you're in for the next 12 months. And I thought, well, that's just not my style. I don't and have never sat around. I just can't. Someone said to me, it's a very Antipodean thing. You guys always need to keep making things happen. The English thing is much more kind of safely and slowly, you know, So I thought, right, what am I going to do here? So I rang Tim up and I said, look, I've got into this freelance pool for Radio 4. Um, What do you think I should do in terms of what would be the best practice next steps? And he said, I definitely ring the person that's production manager. He said, also know a couple of editors. Ring them up, find out, you know, if you can just have a quick five-minute chat, but be to the point. Like let them know who you are, what you do, what you're thinking, can you shadow someone? And I also spoke to Kathy and my radio friends because they were in BBC as well. Um, so I did that and I had to do a lot of follow-ons and I learned that from Salford. Even if you put something out, follow up with the person again and again and again, be persistent. Uh, Eleanor Garland, who's an executive producer at Radio 4, she um, let me come in to shadow on Saturday Live one day and then I also did the same with Women's Hour And then Eleanor rang me up not long after and said, oh, what are you doing next week? Have you got next week free? And I said, yeah. She goes, do you want to come in and work for Saturday Live? Ah, yes. That's what happens. I've got a week free. Yes. But it's never like a week free you can plan. It's like a week free next week. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And I'd been told, take it no matter what. Move everything around. Think about it later. So I did that. And um, 
I worked with um, one of the producers, Paul Williams, and he was really great in terms of giving me hands-on experience. And from there, uh, Eleanor chatted to Women's Hour. I pitched in a few ideas and then I got regular work there due to them having, I think, gaps in the team holiday-wise and whatnot. So I think it was just um, good timing in that regard, yeah. So what is it like working with the Garvey and the Murray? (laughs) I do love working with Jane Garvey because I like the fact and I respect the fact that she's still quite a hard-hitting broadcaster. I do like people that will go in on questions that not necessarily unnerve the guest but I guess because she comes from that news and breakfast background that's her thing and I I think that's still needed in this day and age even if it's a light piece or a heavier piece that might be controversial there's still a way to do it and it's brilliant to work with someone like that who exemplifies how you can do it well still have a great sense of humour. I was going to say, she's so funny. I still like her wit, yeah, throughout how she does things too. Um, she's got a lovely way of, you know, um, getting into the story, getting in, doing all that hard-hitting stuff and then coming back out of it again. So for me, working with Jane has been a great experience. But then also coming from a features background where you want everything to be long-winded, you, I really had to learn how to hone things in radio too, especially topical news. Um, and in terms of producing features every day, the pace is hectic. It's not for the faint-hearted, I think, across the board, as you would know, really. Um, and that's what I say to people. If you like structure, predictable things, working in a certain way, no, don't do radio because you'll you'll have a coronary. It will be like adrenaline-coursing stuff. If you are unable to take a critique um, or find a guest within 30 minutes for something, you're really going to struggle, you know, and I think you need to understand what your um, behaviour is like in a work environment like that. And if you're like that, go for it. If you're not, then maybe do documentary. I don't know. Um, but in terms of the production of features, the funny thing is I kind of came back to that place of what do I want to do again when I was at Women's Hour? More so about what type of stories do I want to produce? Because everyone at Women's Hour, if that's a freelancer, they sit in a certain space. So whether it's pop music or um, sport or political or whatever, everyone's got a genre that they kind of own, if that makes sense. So from the last two months, I found out that I've got a thing for international news. That seems to be my bag. I seem to be really, really drawn to all the newsy stuff that's happening to women on an international level. So, so is there some assigning of stories as well as, or do you find yourself pitching those stories? I interestingly got tasked with a lot of the topicals, which is finding out what's actually happening and then sourcing the guests, putting the brief together, um, you know, writing all the cues for the presenters, the whole gamut. So that is, uh, that's good fun (laughs) when you've got a 24 hour deadline to make, or even less probably because you have your meeting in the morning and then you've literally got half of the day. So I did one, for example, uh, there was uh, four women that were killed in Iraq um, they were in the beauty industry. They were social media people. And the story, yes. you probably would have heard it, hadn't left me. It really struck me because yeah. I thought, what's happening for women in Iraq? We hear so much about women within the country we're in, in developing countries. What What's actually going on there? Um, and so I pitched it. It got up. And that's the other thing too. If you're going to pitch something, make sure you can make it happen. But I already had guests in mind. So I managed to get a human rights activist that's been in Iraq for 50 years very well respected. She spoke to us down the line from Baghdad. And then another lady um, that works in the human rights space, she was in Beirut. So I felt really like relieved and a huge sense of accomplishment when that came through. But um, yeah, there's definitely that pace in any type of talks program that lends itself to topical or news formats. You need to be prepared for that, yeah, yeah. There is a bit of a database where you can go back to guests as well. But I think there also, is, yeah. You're know, looking for a lot, a lot more female guests. You can have a male voice, obviously, at women's hour. But I would say that BBC Roller Decks is going to be quite male. It has to be. It's been, True. It's been going for a long time. So you are going to be doing more digging out new voices just by the nature of looking for women. Yeah, and women's hours are gendered program. So whatever story or item you're doing needs to have a gendered focus. And absolutely, there's people that you can fall back on that it might have spoken to women's hour before but also the thing is it it's not ideal if they've been on radio for in a recent capacity uh so that that strikes your guest out if you find out they have been um but really it is about research you know it is about digging around and thinking what voice is going to suit the nature of this discussion how do I still give it merit but remain impartial or objective and obviously not you know um get anyone that 
not so much opinionated, but, you know, you really do need to think about, okay, if I want to do this item, how am I going to balance it out with the right type of voices? And are they available? Can they do everything within this time frame? What's the line like? Have they got internet access? So you've got a lot of logistics. So your idea might all come together, but then it's bolting down all the logistics to support that. I don't think we hit a point of complacency, but I think for me personally, I constantly like to provoke myself mentally. So I think it's crucial to always look at, okay, what's happening somewhere else? What are other people going through? How do I derive some empathy or activism or how do I change my belief system on this? What You know what I mean? I think if you need to... If you targeted in Iraq, you have to think as well, well, these other women I'm going to, who might be in different positions and in, in, in a different country in terms of Beirut in Lebanon, but would they be willing to talk as well when you have this yeah. dangerous subject of women being targeted, and yeah. being women who speak out? Absolutely. It's not as simple as finding a man who's spoken about the subject before. You have to try and find women, women who are safe to talk about this. Women it's a duty of care. And, yeah. and it's like a woman who's been working there for 50 years. Hannah Anwar had a bullet sent to her in an envelope. We asked her about that and she said yes, because I thought the same thing too. Gosh, if she's been on the front line, very vocal, has all these support networks for women, et cetera, et cetera, what has her existence been like? And she's absolutely been on the receiving end of threats and things like that. And so she's, and she's the person in Iraq who's been there for... Yeah, she's lived in Baghdad her whole life, born and bred. But what does she do? She is a human rights activist, so that's been her game. So she lobbies, she fights against, you know, um, the military and both the government in terms of, you know, how the rule is and, you know, she tries to create um, changes for women from a judicial perspective as well. So it's a hard slog, honestly. It's like getting in contact with a doctor who's kept an abortion clinic going in certain parts of the yeah. US and in other programs, the people they need to get in as spokespeople, which is don't have that level of risk involved. The yeah. person, the speaker calculating their own risks and therefore saying maybe no to you. So you have this really big job with international news of finding women, first of all, in countries where they're not. Time difference. Time di- yes, exactly. That was going against me like a hole in the head that day because the people that I were finding kept um, – like either not going con- to bed, yeah, yeah, you know. So that that's the difficulty too, and that's when I think you need to come back that to that tenacity. And I think there's a gut instinct to news as well. I do believe that. I think with some stories, you just get a feeling um, that it's going to work or that you've got to do it. And I I just couldn't let that story go, and it did. It all came together. And I always give people like my personal mobile for WhatsApp and things like that. Um, and they fortunately, the two of them came back to me in the. Uh, nth hour like right when I was meant to be submitting the pre I was like no just hang on I'm sure they're going to come back which you can't afford to do because if the story's not going to happen you've got to drop it and do something else you know and then you've got to justify your position because you've got this program that's hanging on the scheduling of what's being done in the editorial meeting you know so you can resurrect something from an archive or whatnot but you know the thing is that you've got a team and a a structure of a show no yeah, so um, I think you've really got to be confident, okay, this is going to come through. But I think I learned early on community radio in talks is that um, you put it all out there. If you need to find two guests, I contact six people because, you know, we'll by crook, someone is going to come back to you and majority probably aren't able to do it. So you're better to have, you know, much more options and very limited sort of things to work with, yeah. Going back to that Salford workshop that I got shortlisted for, I later found out that was a diversity workshop. So it was to get groups in that were not the norm that BBC was hiring. I felt a little bit conflicted about that because I thought I don't want to get in on tick box. I'm a really strong believer in getting in on merit. I want to get in because I'm the right person for whatever it is I'm going for. So I don't like to kind of um, play out the diversity card in my perspective too much because I'd much rather be known as Leon Fence and a human being than anything else but coming back to your point I think it's a double-edged sword in that because I am so diverse background wise so my background is Eurasian like it's a mix of Burmese and different European cultures so I'm inherently not one thing I'm Australian by birth I'm technically not Burmese because mum and dad were only born there their parents all came from Europe so ever since I was little I've always had that conflicted sense of identity so I think that's lent itself quite well in terms of how I think because I'm nomadic as well so I think coming back to features whatever circumstance I mean I always want to make people feel valued so yes in that regard I think the makeup of who I am by force of the environment that I've lived in and my cultural identity has made me a person that likes to see value in everyone 
and not kind of label out too much, if that makes sense. But I have noticed that you're right throughout my radio and community radio career, it's definitely, and this isn't, um, I don't know, discriminating or anything, but it's really been white Caucasian people, absolutely. And that's just been the legacy of radio. Even in Australia, it's been older white men. And, you know, from the research that I'm doing in my honours for university, again, in the UK, even though it's been much more, I think community radio has only been around, gosh, in the last 15, 20 years, that demographic is still the same. And I think shaking that off is... um, challenging for radio as an environment but I think audio and podcasting is doing it exponentially because it has a lower barrier to entry I don't I didn't have to apply for this job I invented this it's not regulated is it no it's I just need to make some money out of this (laughs) but um it's it's really interesting then it's not even feedback but kind of the response I have so I say I'm looking for guests it's so interesting Mm. who's coming to me so many women are putting their hands up Say, I definitely think it's because it's you, you know, yeah. you're a female, you know, you're of a certain nationality. I think that it makes it less intimidating. Yeah. I actually came, if I go back to when I read your email and I, the first thing to me was the topic, I thought that is fascinating because yeah. I'm studying that. And throughout my career in audio, radio, whatnot, media, that's definitely been a topsy-turvy journey. I'm so glad you said that because yeah. I feel like that's a real topic to get our teeth into. Yeah. It's interesting. And then also when I looked at you and I madly stalk everyone these days, I mean, who the hell doesn't? I did. I looked at Black Mirror Cracked and I looked at you and I looked at your rap sheet of what you've done. I thought, oh, my God, she sounds fascinating. I want to support her. That was the third thing I decided. You know, she's another female audio producer. Yeah, I mean. It's it's important who you are online. And, you know, when I train people and I do social media, but even we're not talking about social. So I did an SEO training, Mm. especially for like a corporate the other day. And we get started on social. I had one slide in it because – because that's what was asked of me, but I knew we need more. And your reputation is sitting there across the internet, and everything I do adds to that, and everything I am adds to that. So I try to be as clear as possible that this is me, don't use any pseudonyms, even on Reddit, which was very big for Black Mirror, mm. and, like people are chatting about it all the time. And, yeah, it always just be really transparent wherever I, whatever I'm doing, and I just trust that people will research me and say, mm. she seems like someone I can deal with. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I'm just ha- definitely that Women in Iraq one was one that, Really, really stood out for me. Uh, let well, me something think. Something else is like how digital is changing radio. Is that something you're seeing? I think the thing um, that I was probably a little bit innocent of was how all the moving parts work in a format like Women's Hour, which technically is only a 45-minute show. So really it's not even the hour because you've got that radio drama locked in at the end. You know, you've got uh, the studio manager that's obviously controlling everything. You've got the presenter. You've got a production coordinator that has broken the show right down to seconds and minutes. So that person is there ticking everything off as they're going. You've got the producer for the day that's controlling all of those moving parts. You have got someone on the web that's looking at all of the social media commentary, um, the emails coming through. They also are setting up the podcast, which is done straight after. You've got another production coordinator that brings all the guests in and out that are in the green room. Then you've got every single individual producer that's produced the four features for that day. So the presenter is the presenter, but there's a cohort of people that come together to make that happen. And the social media side of it is fundamental to the show now. The show just isn't the show without all of that. You know, you need to prep all of the tweets at 4pm the day before. Um, Yeah, you need to put all of that into the social media scheduler. You need to source imagery from all of the guests, so really nice high-res photos. You've got to think about the web trail um, that goes on the uh, Women's Hour homepage and website. Then you've got to think about images for iPlayer. Now you've got to think about BBC Sounds. Um, You know, so it's not just, okay, let's do a really good strong feature and get it on the show. You've got to think about how that feature then lives again and again and again or how you draw people to listen to that in the first place. How do you get people talking about it? How do you get people tweeting about it? Do you think that audio has a bigger job to do than TV or like a story in terms of getting people from the internet in? I think it does. I don't think any social network sets up to share audio mm. and those sorts of problems. And you need to have a visual. So for this one, I'm going to use the headliner app. Mm-hmm. I'm going to need a picture of you. Yeah. Or I might do one with a women's hour one as well, mm. I think. And you have to think about how to make the audio visual. And I think it's really important to give people a snippet they can just click on. Yeah. So they hear, oh, 
this lady sounds interesting. I'm going to listen to this episode. Yeah. Well, TV is luxurious. Film, um, any type of, you know, YouTube, um, web series. Um, it's luxurious because you've got the visual, like you said. You've got trailers. You've got, um, uh, you know, Instagram videos, Twitter videos, all those kind of things that give you a real, um, you know, deep dive within a very short space of time to immediately pique your interest or opt out and go, oh, that's not for me. Um, and I think that's where TV, you know, has got just an added benefit. Audio, you've got to work harder. Indeed. If you're doing an audiogram or a little clip or if you're trying to trail the show, um, the blurb has to be strong and punchy, doesn't it, like a synopsis for a novel. Yeah. You've got to cut through and make it exciting, Pete, the interest. The voice has to be interesting, the pace of it, the tone of it, how you script your links. Like what you said, so many people do the recording and then they're editing like a mad person. Like what you do with features, you know, you have to curate this um, story story to come out you know um beautifully so that the reader or listener goes on this um you know um like hero's journey like what you do in film right still that arc and things like that so I think audio you have to work harder definitely because you're devoid of the visuals so you're creating um auditory visuals somehow you're having to give the listener something to invent imagination wise you know that you're leaving them with that that's a big responsibility isn't it Unless it's a crime series on audio, I mean, then you just go crime series, someone dies, and then you have loads of listeners. I listen because I'm inherently fascinated why people do it. I think there's that too, you know, psychological what, interest. What makes, actually happened? What yeah. made that person do that? What was the impact on the wider community? Not yeah. only the person, but their family, friends, the whole lot. But yeah. then also how they put it together. I like to know. Not viscerally, but, yeah, maybe viscerally. Like how has that producer managed to provoke you into clinging on and continuing to listen to the series? Yeah. Yeah. I guess the production value is fascinating to me too. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think the Nords do it really well in terms of coming back to TV. I personally think the best crime dramas and thrillers are typically done by the Scandinavians and Nords because they strip out all of the, um, you know, huff and puff of scenery and locations and all that and these – characters are so complicated they're so you know emotionally driven sometimes that that's what hooks me in personally is the character development it's incredible yeah (laughs) so to finish with do you have three top tips for someone who dreams of working as a producer on women's hour three top tips for someone okay for bbc listen to the programs and find out what you're drawn to because you need to want to front up every day um, to an area of the BBC that you want to work in. You know, if you land in a freelance pool for Radio 4 Topical, you know, are you wanting to constantly produce factual programs and news programs? Like is that is, is that what's going to buzz you? Are you going to feel a bit kind of, you know, oh, I don't want to be doing daily stuff all the time. So, yeah, get get a feel for what type of person you are. Are you news, are you current affairs, are you documentary, are you artsy? And then be persistent in terms of that, you know, that I guess I don't know what the word is. I think you cut a certain way in radio. Do you know what I mean? You're going to deliver something based on how you're cut. Um, the second one would be to, um, if you don't know anyone on the BBC already, find people and yeah, talk to them for five minutes or so and find out their pathway, you know, and names of editors and producers and things that will give you at least a few minutes and try to get an inroad, whether you can shadow a program, shadow a producer, just something to give you an insight because you need that. Um, and do, do you think go straight to Jane Garvey and just ask her? I would. <laughs> you know, just be a bit bold because if you get a no, that's okay, but just be polite. Just say, look, because I've seen Jane, kudos to her. She has people that do come in. She's young journalists that come in, other journalists, and um, they do shadow her. And I think she's incredibly helpful, you know, in that respect. I think people quite like helping. I think they do, and I think we're probably a bit funny about that. Like we think, oh, it might be a nuisance, it might be a bother, everyone's so busy. But if you just say five minutes, that's all I want, or can I shadow, I'll just observe just for like one or two hours, just something to give you a little inroad. And the other thing is um, develop a thick skin and then develop another thick skin on top of that. Because um, you are going to get critiqued. There's going to be moments where things really go pear-shaped. Um, they're not going to happen as you want. You know, I think you really need to be able to handle yourself in situations that don't go as planned or having items critiqued and things like that. I think you do need to be very thick-skinned and have a capacity to bounce back fast, you know, and learn. Just It's evolution, isn't it? 
Just go, okay, that went wrong. What went wrong? What would I do differently next time? How could I improve it? Someone said that to me. It's not an attack on me. It's a critique of my work or what I did. And each time it's telling you how to get it better. Yeah, I think so. And I learned that in features, you know, when the editor red marks up your article when you want to cry because you think it's just been completely dissected, um, it hasn't because it's your body of work. And that's what an editor said to me. I'm not coming down on you. When I first started, she said, I'm shaping your work to make it the best it can be because it's in you. But she said, you just can't see it right now. I'm helping you learn an order of a story, the structure of things, grammar, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a critique. Yeah. If it's been accepted for publication, you've already got over that hurdle. Yeah. You're just making it right for the publication, which they work at every day. Yeah. Because they, I assume they know better than I do. Yeah. All the bits and pieces that need to work. Um, I take it as a compliment that it's worth editing. If something yeah. I wrote wasn't it's worth a good editing, way to view it. that'll be a problem. If people are throwing my stuff in the bin wholesale, yeah. I'm in the wrong job. But if they're editing, it shows that there's something to work on. I agree. And if they're not editing at all, that probably usually happens when you know someone and you know... Mm the publication well and they just trust you so yeah. much but then the editor always will be doing yeah something. you've got to be able to detach I think and you know when you're rolling in radio things can happen in rapid fire and niceties go out the window yes. someone's not going to go oh you know by the way Suki can you please call that woman in right where's the woman in Iraq it's going to be delivered to you like that like quite blunt quite not curt or abrupt but just all that fluff's going to be taken out so you have to also be all right with that in the heat of moments when stuff's coming together yeah, so I, agree with you. I, I really do think that's a, a behavioural trait you have to cultivate and develop quite fast in order to sustain and enjoy your time in a radio or audio environment that is maybe a bit more fast-paced. Yeah. Maybe if you're in a different, longer format environment, it might not be like that because, you know, you've probably got milestones where you're catching up on things and your editing process is a little bit more kind of sanguine, isn't it? Like, you know, but it's still challenges there, but... You don't have time to please and thank you. It doesn't That's mean right. You. No, and you do. I think at first that might be quite shocking. You might think, oh, gosh, you know, like what's going on? What have I done? You might get a bit upset, but just think, no, you know what? It's just the work that we're in right now and it'll end and then you've got to do all again the next day. <laughs> That's why work on the job work experience would always be necessary for journalists. You need exposure. Yeah, you need to yeah. see your personality and your way of dealing with. It's not even the level of conflict, but your way of dealing with off-handedness absolutely if that works for you and that's what I've always had to look for in yeah experiences I agree with you you do because it might not be and you know what that's a good learning I think if you decide to opt out that is a credit to you because you can then find where you're better suited you know if you're going to battle it uphill you know um I don't know about that has to be really worth it if you're pushing up against obstacles yeah. Maybe if you're in more of an investigative journalism field and, you know, that's going to be the nature of the work, fair call. But if it's entertainment or something different, you need to fit. You really do. I think a cohesive team, um, you can tell from the production quality that you've got a really banging team on board, you know, because it's like a band. When I was in music journalism, when you go watch a band and you have that level of comfort and you feel good, it's because they're tight. You know, mm. they come on, they're cohesive, they song right together, they pull it all together. So thanks to Leona for telling us all about the inner workings of Women's Hour on Radio 4. As you could probably tell, I absolutely loved hearing about it. I'm a huge fan of Women's Hour. And uh, yeah, it was brilliant to speak to her. If you'd like to get involved in the conversation, I'd love to hear from you. So please do follow Freelance Pod on Twitter and Instagram. You can also join the Facebook group and you don't have to be a freelancer to get involved. If you enjoyed this episode of Freelance Pod, please do rate and review us. This helps other listeners find the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you get a notification every time there's a new episode of Freelance Pod. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.